Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, wonderful to be back with you, sir. Pleasure talking to you, as always. Before the pandemic hit, if you talked about Greece economically, you'd usually say this was the problem child. This was the country that for 10 years has gone through the absolute worst, right? A serious depression that was even greater than the U.S. had a century ago. And yet today, Greece is seen as one of the most effective countries in the world in responding to this pandemic. How, how do you manage that, given just how much trouble you've been through? Well, maybe one of the reasons, um, Ian, we were forced to take decisions very early had to do with the fact that I was totally aware that we had some uh, shortcomings in our healthcare system uh, as a result of, you know, 10 years of underinvestment. I was very much uh, uh, aware that we could not afford uh, to lose, uh, you know, a day in containing this epidemic. So back in March, we took the decisions very, very early. Um, probably a, week, a couple of weeks earlier than most European um, um, countries, and that did make a difference. We trusted the experts. We focused a lot on communication. So I think we, we convinced people that this was for their own uh, good, and we had uh, a, a wave of public support for the measures that we were actually uh, taking. Of course, uh, as you know, it is, uh, from an operational point of view, relatively easy to shut down the economy. At the time, people were not aware of the economic pain that this would actually entail. But we did succeed in, in crushing um, the epidemic during its, uh, during its early uh, stages. And we made it into summer. We started opening up tourism. We did it in a very organized manner, I'd say a rather sophisticated manner by using uh, smart algorithms in terms of predicting who should, be, uh, who should be tested and who should not be tested. We had a few uh, imported cases, and we saw a second wave uh, as of uh, late August, which we've tried to contain, obviously not by um, going to universal lockdown measures. This is not an option we currently have uh, on, uh, on the table, but by, by being smarter uh, in terms of imposing some uh, local restrictions. Our cases so far uh, are around 300 uh, per day. You know, if they stay there, I feel very, very comfortable that we will have no pressure whatsoever uh, on our healthcare uh, system. Economic life in Greece um, uh, has resumed uh, uh, to almost what I would call uh, normal. Of course, we, we have some curfews, you know, bars, restaurants, uh, you know, bars are not uh, anything that has to do with physical interaction, people standing up, we don't, we don't allow. Restaurants are uh, closing by, by 12, uh, masks are um, uh, obligatory in public spaces, indoors, but also in public transport. And people also, during, this second, uh, during the second wave, have also complied. We, you haven't seen much of the anti-masking sort of masking demonstrations that you saw in many other countries, many European countries. 85% of Greeks think that wearing a mask is the right thing to protect yourself, but also the people um, uh, you, you love. So I think we've also managed um, uh, to, to muster the sort of collective um, uh, support that we uh, need. Um, to get through the, the second wave as well. Of course, we're all concerned about what will happen once we start moving uh, indoors, uh, but that's a question that we will probably need to address in, uh, in November or December. One of the things that's so important about Greece's response is not just leading with science, but leading with science early. You know, in, in February, when very few people were paying attention outside China to what was going on, your government was. To what extent were you trying to get other countries in the European Union to pay attention to Greece's response? We saw what happened in Italy, we saw what happened in Spain, the United Kingdom. Well, Italy was the first, uh, and of course they suffered tremendously. And we looked at Italy and we said, we don't want this to happen uh, in, uh, in Greece. I think there's a difference between Greece and Spain. We don't have a federal system. We have a government with an absolute majority, so we can take a decision today and implement it tomorrow. That makes a huge difference when every day counts, and certainly when every week counts. So we were able to move very, very quickly in terms of implementing uh, our decision. This was, for us, a very non-ideological um, 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 topic. We made it about public health, uh, and uh, actually, after many years of, of Greece being uh, uh, accused uh, uh, as, uh, you know, the weak link of Europe. It actually felt pretty good for the Greeks to be receiving, you know, good press because we got a lot of good press internationally about getting this thing uh, right. So I think it also helps the brand of the country, not just now, but also medium, long term in terms of our uh, economic recovery potential. And I do think that the countries that have dealt more effectively with the pandemic uh, will also rebound uh, faster than, than others. As you know, this is, we're, 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 this is a long fight. 
um, and, uh, and, and Greece is warmer than many countries in Europe, but uh, it's gonna get colder. People are gonna wanna uh, go inside. What do you have in place to start thinking about more restrictions as you might need them? How, how are you gonna make that decision? Um, how quickly do you think you might need to move? Look, we, I think we're very good at managing our data and we have very good indicators in terms of you know, looking at the trend of the, uh, of the epidemic. Uh, so of course, you know, the ultimate um, uh, yardstick is you don't want your healthcare system to be overwhelmed. Uh, that's why we're still you know, adding COVID beds, uh, permanent uh, you know, ICU uh, beds. There's gonna be many more coming um, uh, online over the next uh, uh, couple of months because you can always uh, repurpose um, beds, uh, but not at the but you shouldn't be doing it at the expense of your healthcare system. So uh, I think the the real challenge is um, make sure people work from home as much as we can. Um, a private sector, but also public sector. This is all quite new. Keep schools open for as long as you can. We actually made masks mandatory even in kindergarten. So we started with mandatory masks at the age of four. There was a lot of reaction, but I can tell you, kids are pretty obedient, and even if they don't fully succeed. We have enough kids wearing masks. Uh, we have, we've had very few problems at our schools so far, so we want to keep schools open for as long uh, as, uh, as we can. And of course, the challenge is going to be sectors such as entertainment, theaters, movies, cinemas, um, whether uh, they, they can operate at a significantly reduced capacity and what sort of additional economic incentives you need to give them in order for them to at least make it through what is going to be a, different, a difficult winter. And of course, food and beverage. One thing we're doing is we are subsidizing, this may sound trivial to you, but in Greece it is quite important. We're subsidizing uh, external heaters for restaurants so that um, um, people can sit outside uh, for longer. Uh, and you can actually sit outside as long as it's not raining in Greece. We could sit outside even in December uh, if, it's not, uh, if, if it's not too cold. So we'll try to keep people uh, outside as much as we can. And of course, there is a big economic support package We'll be spending in total by the end of the year 24 billion euros to support our economy. Um, and I think we've done everything that was um, uh, appropriate uh, from short-term uh, employment support to one-off payments to people who were on furlough to uh, immediate liquidity supply for companies through essentially a zero interest loan provided by the government based on their revenue shortfall because we wanted to bypass the banking sector. Uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons why if you look at our our performance in the first six months of 2020, where the recession is actually lower than the EU, than the Eurozone average. Many people thought Greece would be destroyed because of our dependence on tourism. Uh, it didn't happen, and I hope it's not gonna happen. As you said, I mean, for many Europeans, Greece has been uh, one of the highlights in the news over the past months. Has that improved, that together with the fact that the Europeans have come together with extraordinary budget and relief, uh, for the southern countries. Is, is that changing the view in Greece of the Germans, of the Northern Europeans, of Brussels? Do, do you feel that the European franchise is actually becoming more robust or at least more integrated on the back of coronavirus? I think you're right. It's a good question. And I think what we achieved as Europe at the last council was extremely important. But I think it also helps that, at least as far as Greece is concerned, the credibility has been restored. There was no concern about Greece not spending the money wisely. Of course, there are constraints. They apply to all European countries. Uh, but I think it is important that Greece at least has restored its political credibility and that, of course, we, we are receiving significant amount of money per capita or per GDP. We're big beneficiaries from this package. We intend to spend it um, wisely. And I've, I've publicly said in Greece which was, that I'm not going to spend it on you know, the money on handouts uh, and, 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 and subsidies here and there. I want to spend the money for real investments, real reforms. It, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to call it a Marshall Plan for Europe, really. Certainly for Greece, it's not an exaggeration. It's, uh, if you get uh, sort of, Greece will be receiving in total close to 70 billion euros over the next six years. It's a lot of money. And it's our job to make sure that this money is absorbed and is spent wisely in projects that have a big you know, multiplier effect that are focused um, uh, in line with the European priorities. But certainly what happened in Brussels has helped the brand of Europe, um, uh, certainly in, uh, in Greece. Let's turn to a more difficult topic, uh, which is Turkey. Uh, you were virtually giving a speech at the United Nations General Assembly just last week. You were calling on President Erdogan to give diplomacy a chance. So let's meet. Let's talk.
and let's seek a mutually acceptable solution. Let's give diplomacy a chance. Certainly there's been a lot of international allies that the Greeks have been relying on, including the United States, Secretary Pompeo, in your country this week. Is international diplomacy working now? I mean, certainly your two countries felt like they might have been at the brink of war just a few weeks ago. It was a, you know, a very difficult summer. Uh, and uh, I want to make it very clear, it was not, not Greece that uh, engaged in any um, uh, escalation or provocation. Uh, this is about um, delimiting our maritime zones. It's been a disagreement we've had with Turkey for many, many years, which we haven't been able to resolve. According to international law, if you have uh, areas which have not been delimited, no party should engage in unilateral activity until the problem is resolved. It can be resolved in two ways. We either negotiate and find uh, a negotiated solution, or you can take the case to an international court, in this case, International Court of Justice uh, in The Hague, and let the court decide on your behalf. Uh, Turkey didn't do either of the two. It sent uh, a, a, an exploratory vessel in what we consider to be Greek exclusive economic uh, zone, uh, accompanied by around 20 warships, um, and also engaged in a rhetoric uh, towards Greece, which was extremely um, uh, belligerent and, and very and flat out uh, uh, hostile. Uh, of course, we you know we also mobilized our fleet, uh, and we've reached a point, and I think it's it's good that the, you know the Turkish ship uh, is is back at port, and we've agreed in principle to. Uh, begin the exploratory talks, which is essentially the first stage before you um, uh, before you enter into a formal negotiation to sit down and see whether we can find some sort of negotiated solution regarding this topic. But yes, international diplomacy has played a role. I think it was very, very clear to many international actors that this was not just a difference between Greece and Turkey, or for that matter, Turkey and Cyprus, because the same activity is continuing, Turkey continues the same activity. It takes it even a step further because it is actually illegally drilling within the Cypriot exclusive economic zone. But this is not just a difference between Turkey, Greece and Cyprus. Uh, it's a difference between Turkey and Europe because strategic European interest rate, uh, interests are at stake. And it's also a, a topic that should really concern the U.S. Uh, because as you know, the U.S. has expressed a renewed interest uh, in, the, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, uh, it doesn't want, you know, destabilizing forces in this part of the world. I think that this is why, you know, uh, Secretary Pompeo's visit to Greece is, uh, uh, is, is so important. Uh, and there's also sort of a, a new a nexus of alliances being formed, the deal between uh, Israel and the UAE. Greece has excellent relationships both with the UAE and with uh, Israel. The trilaterals involving Israel, Cyprus, Greece, Egypt. There are lots of countries who think alike. Turkey chooses to um, uh, sort of um, uh, move in a different direction. I wish it were not the case. I wish we could have a very constructive relationship with Turkey, not only as a neighbor, but also as a member of the European Union. But I think this, this diplomatic pressure, this sort of carrot and stick approach, Europe threatening with sanctions, which would actually, could actually have a big impact on the Turkish economy, given the state it is in right now, with the Lira constantly uh, losing uh, losing value vis-à-vis -vis the dollar uh, and the euro. I think this international diplomatic effort um, um, resulted in us at least being cautiously optimistic that we can give diplomacy a chance. And this is what I will always try to do. Do you think, though, I mean, the Europeans historically uh, are divided on lots of issues, and Turkey is certainly one where there are lots of interests at play. Do, do you feel like that has uh, given Turkey more flexibility? Has that, has that caused more problems for you? Or do you think that the Europeans are in a good place from Greece's perspective on this issue right I now? I think the Europeans understand much better the situation than they did maybe six months ago. Uh, and that that's at some point that this, this is an issue of principles. If the sovereign rights of a member state is attacked, it's an, it's an attack on the European Union. But it's also a question of hard geopolitical power. If we, if we argue that this is a, an area of critical interest for Europe, and if we, just, if we ju don't just want to be a soft uh, economic power, if we want to exercise more geopolitical influence, we should use the levers of our power, which in, which in this case are economic, uh, because we do have a lot of economic um, uh, influence. And this understanding that we need to be more present uh, and more... Uh, more forceful when articulating policies about our immediate neighborhood, 
This is not about something that's happening in the other side of the world. So we can't just afford to put the problem under the rug. Most recently, we've got yet another war uh, that has broken out between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, most countries are calling for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, again, the Turkish response has been different, uh, immediately condemning Armenia and supporting Azerbaijan. Um, how significant is this both for Greece and the region? Oh, we fully aligned ourselves with calls for an immediate ceasefire. And again, it raises questions as to, you know, who seems to jump into any armed conflict uh, in the overall region rather than giving diplomacy uh, a, a chance. Uh, but again, let's see how this uh, uh, th thing plays out. Uh, what we need right now is, is an immediate ceasefire and give the established channels uh, you know, of diplomacy that are dealing with this issue you know, a, a chance to, to reactivate rather than just um, uh, engaging militarily, as seems to be the case. And, and, and final point um, on, on these tensions is there are a lot of people that are saying that the refugees are becoming political pawns uh, between Greece and Turkey in this fight. Uh, obviously, in a time of coronavirus, the people that are most stuck are those that are displaced, are those that have no economic capabilities. How, how do you deal with that challenge? Look, uh, first of all, I want to point out, Ian, that the Greek Coast Guard has saved thousands of people at sea over the past years. Uh, and our number one priority is to protect human life at sea. But we also have a responsibility of protecting our borders. And of course, the people who end up coming to Greece will be treated humanely. They will be treated fairly. We have a new asylum procedure uh, in place. So we're issuing final decisions much faster than, than we did. But of course, this is a problem that requires a European response. But a lot of people, you know, since Europe failed in 2016 to deal with this problem at the European level, thought that the problem didn't exist and that it was just a problem for member states who happened to be on the external frontier of Europe um, to, to deal with. And that is not fair. And this is something which I personally will not uh, accept uh, as a matter of, uh, uh, of principle. So uh, we will uh, uh, continue to take care of people uh, who, are, who arrive in, um, uh, in Greece in a, uh, in a humane manner and make sure we accelerate asylum applications for those of them who, who, who end up receiving asylum. They're welcome to integrate in Greece or if they choose to, 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 go, um, uh, to go elsewhere. But for those uh, whose applications are rejected, we need to do much more um, um, at the European level to make sure that we have organized returns to the countries of origin, because this, I can tell you now, is not happening. So, you know, when, when you and I last spoke on this show, you had not yet become Prime Minister of Greece. If, uh, if today uh, if you could go back and tell Kyriakos of April 2019 one thing, uh, what would it be? Well, I guess throw away all your plans. I don't know, <laughs> um, because we've had so many unexpected things um, uh, happening. But uh, yes, I do remember our last discussion. And certainly at the time, the topic was primarily the economy. No one thought of uh, COVID or you know, a geopolitical crisis with Turkey or a, sort of a new problem with, with migration. But again, I would argue that uh, you know, once you sit in the prime minister's chair, uh, you realize that there are multiple, multiple problems you have to deal with. The one thing which I think you need to do is to make sure you compartmentalize, you know, deal with one problem at a time, make sure you, you split your time um, uh, in, in an effective uh, manner, and, and make sure, what I told you before, not just to be stuck in crisis management mode, but to, to devote significant bandwidth on the long-term changes. Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, always great to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Pleasure talking to you, Ed.